read the first part of I want to read the first part of this again of our text from Romans. And I want you to pay close attention to the first three verses. The first four verses. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now as I started preparing for this several weeks ago, trying to figure out what message from our lectionary that, that's been assigned for the third Sunday of Pentecost, I wanted to figure out what it was that I wanted to deliver, what message God was trying to send me. So after a lot of prayer and prayer and contemplation and then also consultation with Pastor Kevin, Paul's epistles stuck out to me. Now a lot of people would you know, would probably want to look at the gospel lesson and, and all of that, that is there. But there was just something about Paul's epistle here. And I even came back and added verse 11 because I feel like that that is really the key. And I kept looking at it and looking at it and finally, by the Holy Spirit, my little pea brain picked it up. What... What is just making this thing stand out? And I mean, it's, it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So as you can see, I added verse 11. Because I felt like it was the true basis of what Paul was trying to tell us. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. So can you figure out what word got my attention? So I kept asking myself, what does Paul mean when he says, count yourselves dead to sin? Does he mean that as a Christian that we are no longer responsive to, to temptations as though we're some flimsy corpse? Or the stimuli in our brain is just dead? I don't think that's it at all. Because if it was, then he wouldn't have continued in verse 11 or 12 and 13 where he says in 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. And he continues in verse 13. And he continues in verse 13. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin. So if we're dead, how can we offer to ourselves? We have nothing to offer it to. In Romans chapter 8, though, here's what Paul says. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So if our fallen nature was dead in the mortal nature, there wouldn't be any reason for Paul to even write these Beautiful exhortations. So looking at the text, in what sense is it that we are dead to sin? I think it's pretty obvious. I think it has to do with our connection with Christ. How did we become a union with Him? Well, people are going to say, well, through baptism. Well, that's, you're exactly right. But, how did we get to union with Christ? I mean, Christ goes back all the way to the beginning of the world, to the creation. And Ephesians 1 4 tells us, for he chose, chose us in him. 
the creation of the world. He chose us in Him, the creation of the world. So, when and how did we die? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us plainly in his epistles, believers are united with Christ in His death and His resurrection. That's where the union comes from. That's where it all starts. Right there. Because if it weren't for His death and resurrection, and we wouldn't have baptism. We wouldn't have reunion with Him. A union with Him. And so it has to do with that resurrection. I mean, the cross is not the only place where we're forgiven. But it's the place where where we undergo our own death at the very foot of the cross. And upon that cross, my friends, is where the blood bought sacrifice of Jesus as our Christ gave us the gift of grace. And upon that cross, our old self-centered was crucified. And upon that cross, the sins we bore were put to death. Upon that cross, God's grace poured out like the rivers of living water, as it says in the Old Testament, to give us life everlasting. So it was upon that cross that we could begin singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. It was the, in that blood of Jesus that we count ourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ. Because we are in Christ, we can count ourselves dead to sin. Because when Christ died on the cross, God reckoned on our account that we died also. And when Christ rose from the dead, God reckoned to our account that we rose from the dead also. Ephesians 2.5 says, God made us alive with Christ Jesus when we were dead in transgressions. And it is by grace that you have been saved. And it is that grace that we now live under. The resurrection is our grace. Jesus' resurrection has freed us from death so that we can become dead to sin but yet alive in Christ. I mean, we're liberated. We're liberated as Christians by the knowledge that our sins are forgiven. We're liberated by the knowledge that the resurrection to eternal life waits us. I mean, we will never die. Our physical bodies will. But because of our belief in Jesus Christ and what He has done for us, we will be there with Him in paradise. And we're liberated by the risen life given to us by the presence of the Holy Spirit would come to us in baptism. And that new freedom means that we have the choice that we're urged to make here. To live all of our lives under the blanket of God's, that God's grace provides. And as Paul says, now that we are alive to God in Christ Jesus, we are to offer ourselves to God. To offer ourselves to God. That's very humbling. That we get to offer ourselves. Who have been brought, bought from death to life. Brought from death to life. We are to offer our bodily members as God's instruments of righteousness. Now, Paul has taught us about death to sin is given by the grace of God. Now let me ask you this. How does it apply to our daily lives? How does it reach into the depths of our sinful soul? How does it apply to each and every one of us in this room today? We all have our brokenness. We all have that stain of sin that's within us. The psalmist David wrote, and we repeat it in the song, In sin did my mother conceive me. You see, we all 
fall short of the glory of God. But what about those who really struggle? For instance, someone who is battling drugs and alcohol addiction. How is it that that person is going to face the challenges of dying to something that has such a magnetic hold on them? How do we die to our sin when we hold a grudge to a family member over something so trivial as earthly possessions? When we hate our own family? How do we change the habit of telling lies to cover our inefficiencies and laziness? And how do we change our cultural perception of someone because of the color of their skin or the clothes that they wear? We are all slaves to human standards. Human standards can only trouble people, people's conscience because humans are condemned when they can't keep the standards of God. Now we can easily distort the true word of God by adding our own behaviors and thinking that it's okay, we can do whatever we want to do. But that's not God's original plan. And what we need to do as Christians is stand against these practices as the Lord did so on that cross before we become tied to our man-made traditions, our man-made prejudices, our man-made addictions, our man-made hate, our man-made lies. And thievery. It's all man-made because sin is in the world. So let me ask the question, how do we do it? How do we offer ourselves to God when we are nothing but broken and sinful? Well, number one, we ask God to reveal the areas of our personal weaknesses and to make it easy for us, that make it easy for us to be tempted, whether it be the addictions, hatred, sloth, Number two, we recognize the, the areas in which we're easily tempted. We recognize those areas and say, they're areas that can grab hold of us. Number three, we commit to stay away from such sources, people, or situations that would be tempting for us. If, they, if you're in a crowd that's getting you into trouble or that tempts you into t temptations of addictions, or anything else that's simple, you break away from that group. It's very hard. But through God's grace, we're able to do that. Number four, we invest. We invest our time, just like you are today, in godly practices that establishes good habits, such as serving others, attending Bible study, teaching Sunday school, joining a circle, attending golden ages. And number five, we need to remember that it is the sweet, sweet sound of God's grace and strength that will enable us to avoid sin reigning in our bodies. And number six, we need to experience the peace of God rather than the turmoil that sin puts into our lives. I mean, think about it. You, you all know someone in your life that it just seems like they got it going on. You know? It's, they live in peace. They live in harmony. Everything seems to go okay. But they're not. They're broken just like all of us. But it's how peaceful they have accepted God's grace and realized that God, it's in Him we trust. And it is Him that, that will take away the sins of the world. That's the sweet thing about it. And the seventh thing and most important thing is that we remember our baptism. And then if we remember our baptism, we will never, ever, ever forget about God's grace. Because Jesus, He's already paid the penalty for us. God doesn't condemn us when we fail to meet His perfect standards. That's why He sent Jesus. 
But God calls us to holy living. His call comes with the conviction that we are to be children of God. And if we try to run our lives the way we used to when we were dead in sin, we fall short. And the only way to succeed, succeed is to have faith in Jesus and His wonderful grace. Now how many of you remember Peanuts, the comic strip character named Pigpen? He was probably my favorite character. The creator of the comic strip, Charles Schultz, described Pigpen as a human soul bank who raised a cloud of dust on a perfectly clean street. Wherever Pigpen went, he had a dirt cloud that loomed around him. It was a nasty, ugly, stink cloud. We're no different. When we show a lack of self-control by allowing sin to enter our lives, when we allow sin to live in us, we carry that stink cloud around wherever we go. But yet, but yet, it is that death to sin. It is that grace from the resurrection that we are cleansed, that we have our our bath in the living waters of Jesus Christ's blood. And we've got to set our minds <coughs> on the things of God, seeking to please Him and be obedient to Him in all that we do. My final statement is this. Sin no longer has dominion over us. We are now free to retreat against sin's deathly grasp and choose to follow Christ. We choose to follow Christ. Not because of what we've done, but what He has done for us. Saying yes to God. Yet fully knowing that it's only made possible by God's grace. His amazing grace. At working us through the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Our choice doesn't make us worthy. But our choice is necessary. If we're to live Christ risen life in the midst of this fallen world. And while we're still in these fallen, broken, sinful, dirty bodies, Christ died for us. That's the challenge of the gospel we confess. That's the, that's the challenge of the gospel we preach. Consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And in response, we exercise our will to put death, that which belongs to the old Adam, and presenting our bodies to God as instruments of righteousness. Plainly stated, dead to sin. <clears throat> How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now I'm found. It's a beautiful word. beautiful words and it's meaningful words. May the God of grace fill you, fill you with the riches of His goodness that you choose to follow God because of the love that He has given us and cleanses us of all of our sins. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue.